United States notes with, gro with great concern the growing cholera epidemic and the prolonged gang-imposed fuel blockade. We are in receipt of the government of Haiti's appeal for urgent international armed security assistance to address the current humanitarian crisis in Haiti and the Secretary General's letter urging support for such a force. We are currently reviewing this request in coordination with international partners. Right now, however, our staff are, is on the ground in Haiti, working alongside Haitian health workers and NGOs to respond to the cholera outbreak and deliver care to those who need it. We will accelerate delivery of additional humanitarian relief to the people of Haiti. The United States government recognizes the role armed gangs and criminal actors play in disrupting the free flow of fuel, humanitarian supplies, and life-saving services for the Haitian people. As a, as a friend of Haiti, the United States government is accelerating our diplomatic, humanitarian, and security response. We are coordinating with international partners as well as within our own government to increase security assistance that will facilitate the movement of humanitarian relief. We will do our part bilaterally and multilaterally to hold accountable criminal actors who impede the provision of humanitarian assistance. Building on UN Security Council Res Resolution 2645, we have drafted with our close partner, Mexico, a resolution proposing specific sanctions measures against individuals who support and or engage in acts of gang violence, corruption, and human rights abuses in Haiti. These measures also serve to enable the international community to address the many challenges facing the people of Haiti. Earlier today, Secretary Blinken also took steps to impose visa restrictions under Section 212A3C of the Immigration and Nationality Act against Haitian officials and other individuals involved in the operation of street, gang, street gangs and other Haitian criminal organizations. Such actions may also apply to these individuals' immediate family members. At this time, the department is identifying an, an initial group of individuals and their immediate family members who may be subject to visa, to visa restrictions under this policy. With these visa restrictions, we are sending a clear message that those providing support to Haitian street gangs and other criminal organizations through financial and other forms of material support, including facilitation of illicit arms and, nar and narcotics trafficking, along with their immediate family members, are not welcome in the United States. The United States will continue to monitor the situation in Haiti to determine if further visa restrictions are necessary. As the situation in Haiti worsens, the time has come for political leaders in Haiti to put aside their differences to find a path towards sustainable peace. Assistant Secretary Nichols will urge Prime Minister Henri, members of the Montana Group, the private sector, and civil society to develop consensus on a path forward that will lead to the reestablishment of democratic institutions, free and fair elections, and economic prosperity for the benefit of all Haitians. The United States stands with the people of Haiti and their desire to see an end to the political impasse and prolonged violence that have aggravated the humanitarian conditions for many innocent people. And finally, tomorrow we will welcome Mexican Foreign Secretary Marcelo Ebrard, Secretary, uh, Security Secretary Rosa Isela Rodriguez, Attorney General Alejandro Gertz, and other senior officials from the government of Mexico to the State Department for the 2022 U.S.-Mexico High-Level Security Dialogue. Secretary Blinken will co-lead the dialogue, and U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland, Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas, USAID Administrator Samantha Power, and other senior U.S. government officials will join the Secretary in welcoming their Mexican counterparts to discuss the implementation of the U.S.-Mexico Bicentennial Framework for Security, Public Health, and Safe Communities as adopted during the 2021 High-Level Security Dialogue hosted in Mexico City. Secretary Blinken will also meet bilaterally with Mexican Foreign Secretary Brard and host a joint press availability at the conclusion of dialogue. We remain committed to working with Mexico as sovereign equal partners to better protect the health and safety of our citizens, prevent criminal organizations from harming our countries, and upholding human rights while bringing criminals to justice. With that, happy to turn to your questions. Thanks, Dad. Uh, uh, just two legit, brief, very brief logistical ones. Uh, the, the press conference tomorrow is just going to be uh, Foreign Secretary Ebrard and the Secretary, or is Attorney General Garland and their, their counterpart? The fuller cast will take part tomorrow, yes. Okay, so we can expect questions on a very wide range of issues. And then, uh, because you mentioned uh, Mexico and the uh, Security Council resolution, um, how much, if at all, do you think that Haiti is going to be a topic of, of discussion, or is that something that is you've already worked out, and so it doesn't need? Uh, no, Matt. It will be a topic of discussion. We have worked very closely with Mexico 
uh, on the challenges that the people of Haiti are facing at the moment, owing to uh, gang activity, owing to crime, owing to violence, owing to the growing uh, cholera epidemic. As you know, we work with uh, our Mexican uh, partners in the UN context uh, on the uh, existing Security Council resolution to ensure uh, that those criminal and other actors who are in large part responsible for the suffering uh, of the Haitian people are held accountable and face appropriate consequences. We uh, had good discussions with our um, counterparts, our Mexican counterparts, in Lima uh, last week. As you know, the Secretary co-chaired uh, a meeting with Canada uh, and with Haiti uh, under the OAS auspices uh, on the challenges that uh, the people of Haiti are facing. Uh, we did have an opportunity to uh, hear from our Mexican partners there as well, um, but I do expect that Haiti will no be doubt. top of it. And then uh, just on the broader migration issue, no doubt you have seen reports from yesterday about uh, the administration considering a new plan for Venezuelan migrants and uh, offering them the, the same uh, parole process that uh, Ukrainians, for example, have. Um, whether or not you want to discuss that plan, which I understand is not fully baked yet, but uh, is this a topic that, we'll, that you also expect to come up? I do expect migration to be discussed with our Mexican partners tomorrow. Uh, as you know, DHS Secretary Mayorkas uh, will uh, take part. Uh, his counterpart uh, will take part in addition to Foreign Secretary Everard. Uh, so I do expect the uh, challenge of migration in our hemisphere uh, to feature in these uh, discussions, just as they were a feature of our engagement in Lima last week. As you know, uh, the secretary in Lima took part uh, in a ministerial focused on uh, migration, focused on follow-up uh, from the Summit of the Americas, where we met with uh, those countries that have signed on, those 20, 20 other countries, 21 total countries that have signed on to the LA Declaration. It was an opportunity for them to review the three pillars of the LA Declaration, and more importantly, uh, to demonstrate the progress that these signatory countries uh, have been able to achieve in the months since June, when the LA Declaration uh, was initially signed and came into force. I, I imagine many of our fact sheets may go to your uh, spam, fil spam folder, um, but we no, did. Absolutely, we, we I did make issue. sure that they all go directly to my VIP box. I would I would commend to you a um, fact sheet that we issued uh, last week in the context of uh, this ministerial because uh, it was meaty, it was long, um, but it was long for a good reason. Uh, there have been a number of steps that these 21 countries have taken since June. Uh, to realize the ambitions that the LA Declaration puts forward. And that's the real point for us. Uh, the LA Declaration was and is historic in, in, in the sense that it was the first time this collection, this broad collection of countries have come together around a common framework for migration in our hemisphere. But uh, perhaps more meaningfully, uh, it has been the blueprint for action. And in the few short months since June, uh, we have seen really tremendous action uh, many of which were delineated in the fact sheet we put out last week. Andrea. Uh, Ned, the president said last night that he agreed that the relationship with the Saudis has to be recalibrated, not just given what their decision was on OPEC plus, especially with the implications for Russia. How do you take a look at the various proposals that have been floated from the Hill um, to change the defense posture? Easily without affecting our um, situation vis a vis Iran. Well, that's precisely what we're doing. We're taking a look. Uh, this will be a process that uh, will play out in the coming weeks and the coming months as we speak with uh, the relevant stakeholders uh, and those who uh, will be a part of our decision making and a part of the conversation uh, as we determine uh, how to recalibrate this relationship. Uh, there are a number of members on the Hill who have uh, very strong opinions in terms of what the U.S.-Saudi relationship uh, should look like. We want to make sure that we are hearing those ideas and those proposals directly from them. We want to ensure that we understand uh, those initiatives, those proposals, uh, as well as their implications. We also want to make sure that we're consulting closely with other stakeholders as well as other uh, countries, um, partners in the region and around the world. Our goal, and this is our goal 
in every bilateral relationship we have. But our goal is to see to it that our relationship with Saudi Arabia is calibrated and recalibrated in such a way that it is most effectively serving our interests. Uh, this is a relationship that, over the course of years, has not always effectively uh, served our interests. We want to make sure that going forward, uh, we have a relationship uh, that is sustainable uh, and a relationship uh, that ultimately uh, redounds to the benefit of Americans uh, and the benefit to our interests in the region. Can I follow up on you? Sure. There is a, a proposal by Senator Blumenthal and Representative uh, Ro Khanna to hold uh, arms sales and deliveries to the Saudis for 10 months. Is that something that you would support? Uh, again, Saeed, I, I am not in a position to go beyond what I just told Andrea, what I said yesterday as well. And that's precisely because this is a process that needs to be deliberate, it needs to be deliberative. It needs to be inclusive, uh, and it needs to be one that uh, we take great care with, and we're going to. This is a process that will play out over the course of weeks and months. There are a number of proposals, uh, some of which have been floated uh, publicly, some of which uh, have been conveyed privately. We want to make sure that uh, we are familiar with them, that we understand them, we understand the implications uh, of them, and that we have an opportunity to speak with stakeholders on the Hill uh, and elsewhere. So how no. such a relationship that was so strong, you know, such an alliance that was unbreakable, you know, move from being so strong to something like we have today, I mean, you know, uh, to, you know, what, what, what do you do, uh, in other words? I mean, could, should you be using armed deliveries as leverage? Uh, Said, we are going to do what is in the interests of the American people, uh, and what ultimately serves the benefit to the benefit uh, of our interests in the region. Uh, the fact is that we do have shared interests uh, with the Saudis. We do have shared interests with other countries in the Gulf. Uh, we do have shared interests with other countries in the region, certainly to include Israel, uh, but uh, beyond that as well. So we want to make sure that as we think about changes that need to be made to this relationship, we are holding those interests, uh, along with our values, the paramount importance of, of human rights in our foreign policy, uh, that we are holding those dear, that they are guiding us and orienting us uh, as we listen to proposals, as we have these conversations on Capitol Hill, as we have these conversations in foreign capitals, as we have these conversations uh, with other uh, stakeholders at home and around the world. So, Not, uh, Saudi Foreign Minister has said uh, today that uh, the OPEC plus decision was based on the oil market needs, not on politics, and Saudi Arabia didn't stand with Russia against the U.S. Do you have any reaction? Our contention, and this is not a, a contention uh, that uh, we are alone uh, in, in sharing and holding, is that energy supply needs to meet energy demand. Uh, in our estimation and the estimation of countries around the world, uh, what the OPEC cartel announced last week uh, does not comply with uh, that core principle. Uh, it's not a, only a core principle of energy, it's a core principle of uh, economics, that supply needs to meet demand. Uh, we are in an especially perilous fragile, I should say, um, environment, a fragile economic recovery, an economic recovery uh, that is facing continued headwinds, headwinds from COVID, headwinds uh, stemming from President Putin's aggression against Russia and the uh, implications it has had in terms of not only energy prices, but food prices, commodity prices, uh, some of the other uh, supply chain issues that have resulted uh, from it. So. Again, this does not seem to be a decision that comports with that core principle. We believe that it is a, a decision that was short-sighted, uh, that was uh, mistaken. And regardless of the intent behind it, uh, the fact of the matter is that this decision does and will work to the benefit of President Putin, 
of Russia in the near term. Uh, it may well elevate energy prices, especially uh, for those lower and middle income countries, those countries that are not as resilient to um, price uh, shocks, price changes, uh, as the United States is, countries that don't have the same domestic energy infrastructure that we do, those countries that are not in a position to produce 500,000, um, uh, hundreds of thousands of barrels of oil per day uh, domestically. Now, over the long term, that won't be the case. Over the longer term, this decision will not work to the interests of Saudi Arabia. It will not work to the interests of Russia. It will not be in the interests of any other member of uh, the OPEC cartel. And that's principally because uh, this decision is just another reminder of what uh, we have known for uh, some time now, that we need to, we must lessen our dependence on uh, foreign supplies of oil. Uh, we must become uh, more dependent on uh, what we're able to produce from ourselves, uh, what we are able to uh, do with our uh, allies and partners, and ultimately uh, to accelerate the transition to renewables. Uh, this is a decision that will only accelerate uh, all of those processes, and that ultimately won't work to the benefit of President Putin. Nick. Um, there's some reporting today that in the days before the OPEC decision, U.S. officials were calling Saudi counterparts, urging them to delay the decision for a month. Is that true? Is there anything you can elaborate on, on that? And if it is true, how would a month change the dynamics that you just mentioned? We have had discussions with OPEC, including with uh, the Saudis, uh, for months now. Uh, and really going back uh, to the earliest parts of this administration. But uh, as you know, those uh, engagements have intensified with President Putin's uh, aggression against Ukraine and the implications for the energy market that it engendered. Uh, so it is no secret that we have conveyed uh, repeatedly, privately, but also publicly, uh, that the core principle to our Saudi, to the Saudis, that energy supply needs to meet energy demand. Uh, this was a message that the Saudis heard uh, long before President Biden's travel to the kingdom earlier this summer. It was a message they heard in the aftermath uh, of that visit because it is and it was and is an important message it, because of the fragile moment we're in with the global economic recovery, uh, the inopportune timing, uh, to put it mildly, uh, in which this announcement was made as uh, the global uh, economic recovery is ongoing, but facing these headwinds uh, that I spoke to before. Uh, it's a, a principle that is as true and relevant today as it uh, was before this decision was made. Energy supply needs to meet energy demand. Yes. Ned, can I just follow up on that? Can you understand, though, why it would look curious to some, considering we're just about a month away from the midterm elections, where there's reporting that U.S. officials called Saudi Arabia to delay this decision by a month, putting it after the midterm election. I, I certainly can't confirm that report. What I can confirm is that we conveyed a consistent message to the Saudis. Energy supply needs to meet energy demand. We have made the point repeatedly that we have a multiplicity of interests with Saudi Arabia. Energy is one of them. Uh, and in the context of those discussions regarding energy, uh, we have had senior members of the administration travel to Saudi Arabia in recent months. This was not, um, uh, this engagement uh, did not uh, take place solely in the context of uh, October 22, uh, 2022 or September uh, 2022. This is engagement uh, that took place over the course of many months. And it took place over the course of many months because we wanted to send a clear and consistent message that energy supply needed to meet energy demand and especially at this moment, this moment where the uh, global economic recovery is ongoing, uh, but has the potential to endure setbacks from uh, the headwinds that we've discussed and uh, any additional headwinds that would come from an announcement like this one. And then just a quick follow-up, why, why wait to take action? We keep hearing about actions, uh, consequences, but they won't happen until senators come back to the Hill, which is not going to be for a while. This is going to put us deeper into a further energy crisis. People are wondering about how to heat their homes. It's getting colder out. 
Why wait? We're not waiting. Uh, this is a process that is ongoing. Uh, we want to make sure that this is a process that is deliberative and deliberate, uh, but also inclusive. And by necessity, this will be a process that will take some time. But I don't want to limit the impression uh, that we are sitting on our hands, uh, that we are waiting for uh, anyone to return to uh, Washington, that we're waiting um, on any external factor. Uh, we are uh, engaging, we will continue to engage, uh, but we'll also uh, be deliberative uh, and take the uh, care that uh, a decision like this deserves. So what is the timeline? Because the president did say on camera today that he would want to wait until the senators came back. To Washington. So what, what is the timeline here? Weeks, months? I, I would say both. Uh, this is a process that will play out over the course uh, of weeks and months. Uh, this is a process that needs to be, um, uh, that needs to be uh, uh, over the course of weeks and months uh, because we want to hear those perspectives. We want to understand the proposals. Uh, we want to understand uh, the implications. We want to hear the perspectives uh, of other stakeholders. We want to uh, consult with uh, partners around the world as well. And what if the balance at the Capitol or in the Congress changed in November? This is uh, something to us that uh, transcends politics. Uh, this is about uh, core national interests. Uh, and those core national interests don't depend on who's in the Capitol. They don't depend uh, on um, domestic politics here at home. Uh, these are interests of ours that are enduring uh, and that will be uh, the same a month from now as they as they are today. Jenny. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions on Korea and uh, first question is North Korea. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un said that it is not afraid of any sanctions imposed by the United States. Are there any sanctions that could really hit North Korea, or are you considering secondary boycott sanctions? We have been clear that as long as the DPRK continues with its provocations, continues with uh, its launches of ballistic missiles, including uh, longer range ballistic missiles and the sorts of provocations uh, that we've seen intensify on the part of the DPRK in recent weeks, we will continue uh, to hold responsible uh, those who are overseeing the DPRK's WMD and nuclear weapons programs, uh, those who are uh, in a position to um, uh, support this program, uh, those who may be helping the DPRK uh, systematically evade sanctions that uh, have already been announced. Uh, this is something that we are doing with our own authorities. And just within recent days, we've announced additional sanctions targeting uh, the DPRK's WMD and um, uh, ballistic missile programs. Uh, but it is also something that we will continue to discuss uh, with our allies and partners, including in the Indo-Pacific, with our partners uh, in New York and our partners around the globe to see to it that we are doing everything we can, can to hold accountable those who are placing uh, their WMD programs uh, over the welfare of the, D the people of the DPRK. Uh, this is a program that is consuming massive amounts of resources. Uh, this is a program that is dangerous. It is a program that is destabilizing. Uh, it is a program uh, that poses a threat not only to our interests in the region, but uh, to those of our uh, treaty allies as well. And we will use appropriate tools to, ho to hold accountable uh, those who are overseeing it. So one more uh, fact. Uh, regarding the joint declaration <coughs> on the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, which the two Koreas, I mean, South Korea and North Korea, agree to. But uh, South Korea is uh, trying to scrap this. Do you think that if North Korea conducts its seventh nuclear test, it should be uh, abandoned because North Korea violated the uh, joint declaration on the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, I will leave it to our ROK allies to speak to their policy uh, and to speak to any potential shifts in their policy. If there is a seventh nuclear test for our part, we have made clear um, 
ourselves. We've made clear bilaterally with our South Korean allies. We've made clear trilaterally, trilaterally with our South Korean and Japanese allies uh, that there will be additional costs imposed on the DPRK if it goes forward with the seventh uh, nuclear test. Uh, if the DPRK has the erroneous belief that the types of provocations that it has mounted, especially in recent weeks and recent months, give it any additional leverage, uh, the consequences that it will bear from the international community will prove once again that is not the case. The provocations that we've seen from the DPRK have only further isolated uh, the DPRK regime. They have only uh, made it the object of uh, condemnation, certainly have not given it, afforded it any additional leverage. Uh, and if the DPRK were to go forward, uh, there would be significant additional costs imposed on it. So if South Korea is trying to scrap this, the United States support this? I, I will leave it to our South Korean allies to speak to their policy. Uh, Alex. Thank you. I have a couple of questions involving uh, Russia. Let me start with uh, the new national security strategy. How do you want us to read the strategy when it comes to the Russia threat? Is Russia posing the let's say, most uh, dangerous uh, threat against the U.S. and its allies right now than in comparison with uh, the guidance that we saw earlier this year? In comparison with the national security guidance that you had you laid out earlier this year? Uh, what this, in I don't want to go too far uh, into this, of course, because the National Security Advisor is, I believe, uh, at this moment offering uh, remarks on uh, this national security strategy. But um, what this strategy does, uh, rather than provide an extensive accounting uh, of every single challenge or opportunity America uh, faces, uh, it really touches on our plans uh, in every region of the world uh, and outlines how we will seize what it calls a decisive decade uh, to advance our uh, vital interests. It does lay out a couple um, strategic challenges. Uh, it makes the point that strategic competition between major powers uh, to uh, shape the future of the international order uh, is a decisive force. It uh, makes the point that uh, while we recognize uh, this competition between <coughs> Uh, major powers, uh, people all over the world uh, are struggling to cope with the effects of uh, the shared challenges uh, that know no borders, that uh, cross borders, that are by their very definition transnational, whether that's climate change, whether that's food security, whether it is communicable disease, terrorism, energy shortages, or inflation. Uh, and the strategy makes clear that shared challenges like these oftentimes um, while they have oftentimes been relegated to the sidelines, uh, these are not marginal issues that are secondary to geopolitics. Uh, these are issues uh, on which we um, must work together uh, with allies and partners around the world, uh, knowing that there is no challenge the United States can more effectively take on alone uh, than we can when we have allies and partners by our side. And I think over the course of the 20 uh, months or so of this administration, you've seen any number of proof points in the way we've tackled COVID, uh, in the way uh, we have sought to uh, slow the effects of climate change, uh, in the way we have marshaled uh, a coalition uh, to take on Russia's aggression against Ukraine, uh, to support Ukraine in the first instance, but also uh, to impose massive costs and co consequences uh, on the Russian Federation. Uh, that is a model that can apply to uh, the strategic challenges uh, we face, uh, but it is also a, a model we can and uh, will continue to apply to the shared challenges uh, we face. So do you view, the, do you view Russia as the top national security threat that you're facing right now? As a, as a top uh, national security threat? Well, there is no question that uh, we have spent um, countless hours uh, focused on uh, the threat that Russia is posing to Ukraine, uh, but more than that, the threat that Russia is posing to the international order. This is not only an unjustified, brutal assault on the people and government of Ukraine, uh, this is uh, an assault, a strike at the very heart uh, of the UN principles, 
of the UN Charter, of the UN system, uh, of the international order. That has undergirded some eight decades of unprecedented levels of stability, of uh, prosperity, of opportunity for people all over the world, including, by the way, uh, a system that uh, in many ways enabled uh, the rise of a country like Russia. Uh, so there is no question that uh, we view Russia's aggression uh, with the priority that it deserves. I think you can see that in what we do day in, day out here. Uh, and again, the backbone of our strategy, uh, there are many different facets of it uh, that we can speak to in any tactical detail. But the backbone of our strategy is the same strategy you see us applying across the board, whether it is to shared challenges or strategic competitors. It is uh, built on the efforts that we've undertaken to repair, to refurbish, to revitalize uh, our systems of partnerships and alliances. Uh, and it's ultimately marshaling those with American engagement, with American diplomacy, uh, with American leadership to make sure that our efforts are uh, calibrated, they're effectively uh, trained, and ultimately that they're effective in taking on uh, the challenges that we face. So one more question on the Putin factor. Uh, we hear recently some Western officials are subscribing to a new narrative uh, you know, saying that Putin is under pressure of, uh, quote unquote, hardliners, which is like, you know, clear departure of, let's say, the viewpoint that you have been putting uh, here, uh, saying that Putin's staff is for and he's the only man that could stop this war. Uh, what is your reaction to that narrative and also the fact that your Western allies, including some folks in this administration, are increasingly subscribing to that in light of recent attacks in Ukraine? I'm not familiar with that line of analysis. Uh, it has always been our contention and our firm belief uh, that um, President Putin uh, is and has been uh, behind uh, this aggression. He has been behind this, this brutal assault. Um, it has may well have been the case that uh, <coughs> this is the, an example of the Achilles heel of autocrats, as Secretary Blinken, uh, the point Secretary Blinken has made on a number of occasions, that uh, he has uh, received guidance, uh, received advice uh, that may not have been um, fully uh, accurate, that may not have been uh, all that uh, wise, but ultimately, uh, President Putin is the one who has called the shots. Uh, he is the one who ordered the invasion. He is the one uh, that could put an end to this brutal war tomorrow. Nazira. Uh, thank you, Mr. Price. I asked a question, supposed to ask yesterday because of young generation, young girl, they celebrated the, around the world yesterday and an Afghan girl uh, criticized me and they asked me why you didn't ask this question from a surprise that is still Girls, girls in Afghanistan not able to go to school. School is still closed. One question. The second question. Secretary uh, Blinken today announced that uh, for Taliban and their family, they bring some change for their visa and their families' visas issue. And number three, so many Afghan refugee in uh, Abu Dhabi's camps. They demonstrated and they complained because their situation is very bad. They left behind in Abu Dhabi. Any comment to expedite their case to come to the United States, all those refugees? Sure. Uh, let me take those uh, questions uh, in, in order. Uh, as you noted, we did mark uh, International Day of the Girl Child yesterday, uh, and it was an opportunity for us uh, to honor uh, the contributions that girls and women are making uh, to countries around the world. Uh, and Afghanistan is an example of a country where women and girls uh, face extraordinary adversity, uh, adversity that they should not have to face, adversity that the Taliban committed uh, publicly and privately on many different occasions uh, that they would not enforce, that they would not uh, apply against the women and girls of Afghanistan. Of course, uh, that has not been the case. The Taliban has not lived up uh, to its commitments. Uh, we've made the point many times that the Taliban's policy towards women and girls are an affront to human rights. As long as the Taliban repress the women and girls of Afghanistan, uh, the Taliban's relationships with the rest of the world uh, will suffer. 
this is an issue that we are discussing with countries uh, around the world, the legitimacy and support uh, that the Taliban seek from the international community depend on their conduct, including centrally uh, their respect for universal rights, uh, fundamental freedoms, and that includes uh, the universal rights that are accorded uh, to women, to girls, to religious minorities, to ethnic minorities, uh, and to all the people of Afghanistan. Uh, we've called on the Taliban to overcome uh, whatever impediments exist uh, to allow girls to uh, obtain access to education at all levels, uh, to cease any additional restrictions that impede their ability to move and to study freely, uh, and, the, and to honor the commitments that the Taliban has repeatedly made to the people of Afghanistan. Uh, we've repeatedly stated that the legitimacy and support um, the Taliban seeks from the international community begins with the legitimacy they earn from their own people uh, and from the actions that they direct towards their own people. Uh, and in unison with our uh, partners around the world, we'll continue to watch the Taliban's actions very closely. We'll continue uh, not only to support the people of Afghanistan with humanitarian support, hundreds of millions of dollars of humanitarian support that has flowed from the United States to the people of Afghanistan uh, since uh, late last year, uh, but also to impose costs and consequences on those Taliban officials who are responsible uh, for what are grievous affronts to the human rights of the Afghan people. Uh, we took a step in that direction yesterday uh, with the imposition of visa restrictions on uh, two members, uh, on, on two senior leaders, uh, and we'll continue to impose costs and consequences uh, as appropriate. Yes. Thank you, Ned. You have confirmed that the phone call took place between Secretary Blinken and the President of Serbia, uh, President Aleksandr Vucic. Uh, can we also expect um, a high-level in-person meeting between the two leaders uh, somewhere in the future? And also, I understand uh, from your statement that they talked about energy di diversification in Serbia, and I am assume in the Western Balkans overall. Uh, can you please tell us what are the specific expectations for Serbia to uh, complete in terms of the steps? Because, you know, everyone's talking about like, energy diversification, but if you can just, like, unpack this a little bit so people understand, you know, what is the actual expectation is. Thank you. Uh, sure. So uh, you were uh, correct that the secretary did have an opportunity to speak with uh, Serbian President Vucic and uh, Kosovan Prime Minister Kurti on October 11th. Uh, he took the opportunity to underscore our support for the EU-facilitated dialogue between Kosovo uh, and Serbia, and he urged uh, continued constructive steps and engagement to secure peace uh, instability across the region. He made very clear uh, that the United States is uh, a partner to, in this case, uh, Serbia, as a partner uh, to the people of uh, Kosovo. We support uh, their uh, aspirations, their European uh, aspirations, uh, and we will work to continue to, um, uh, to, to back them. Uh, when it comes to energy, uh, the point he made with uh, the Serbian president is similar to the one uh, that we've made to countries around the world, uh, that recent events and recent actions, including those on the part of uh, the Russian government, have only underscored the imperative of uh, in incre increasing resilience to uh, potential disruptions in energy supply, uh, whether they're man-made or otherwise. Uh, and to diversify um, energy um, uh, so that no country can be held hostage uh, to the weaponization, attempted or otherwise, uh, of energy by any other country or entity. Uh, we've seen the implications associated with <clears throat> what President Putin has sought to do uh, throughout uh, Europe, the implications that are being felt uh, around the world, and it's our goal in our bilateral relationships uh, around the world to uh, do what we can to support uh, greater resilience, to support greater de diversification, uh, to see to it that uh, countries aren't held hostage to this sort of policy. Uh, uh, let, me, let, me, let me move around just to people who haven't asked a question. For, uh, okay, very quickly. Uh, on the agreement between uh, Israel and uh, Lebanon, uh, the Israeli government has agreed on the agreement. Have you received any answer from them? And uh, what should we expect? 
So this is a process that uh, will play out over the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, this is a process that in the first instance will take, plate, take place uh, in the uh, governmental systems and the national systems of Israel and Lebanon. Once those processes are complete, uh, the countries will send to the United States uh, their intent to subscribe to the parameters uh, of this deal. Uh, upon receipt of that, we will confirm uh, to those two countries as the facilitator of this deal uh, that we have received uh, those uh, commitments and the deal will move forward uh, at that time. Do you feel, do you, do you, let, me, let me move around to, yes, sir. Thank you, Ned. On Bangladesh, Bangladesh government is very attacking on freedom of speech and freedom of association, at least three people, three opposition activists killed recent days. And US imposed sanction on rapid action battalion, but Bangladesh prime minister just returning back from the US mentioned that the RAB, which is uh, sanctioned by the US for serious abuse of human rights, she told that the RAB created by US and US provided training and logistic and arms, and now they are acting for the training they have got from the U.S. What is your comment on that about this authority and prime minister remarks? Well, the fact is that uh, based on credible information implicating uh, the Rapid Action Battalion or the RAB in gross violations uh, of human rights, we did end assistance to the RAB in 2018. This was some uh, four years ago that we ceased our assistance to this group, and in fact, in, in December, December of last year, December of 2021, uh, we sanctioned the RAB as well as six current and former officers under uh, what's known as our Global Magnitsky Sanctions uh, Regime in connection with uh, the RAB's involvement in uh, serious and gross uh, human rights abuse. Uh, and we publicly designated two former RAB officials uh, under a separate authority, 7031C, uh, for their involvement in gross violations uh, of human rights, whether it is in Bangladesh, whether it's uh, anywhere else in um, uh, South Asia or anywhere else around the world. Uh, we have placed human rights at the center of our uh, foreign, foreign policy. And we are committed likewise to drawing attention to and putting a spotlight on uh, those who are responsible for human, viol human rights violations uh, when they occur. Uh, these sanctions and these visa restrictions uh, aim to promote accountability and reform for the RAB and to deter human rights abuse uh, globally. Uh, and just as we hold uh, these actors accountable, we'll continue to partner with countries to develop uh, their own capacity to fight crime, to administer justice, uh, and to safeguard uh, the rule of law. Our training to Bangladesh security forces uh, promotes uh, these very principles. And what is your comment about the opposition government is attacking on opposition peaceful demonstration and freedom of speech and freedom of association? Our comments when it comes to uh, any attack on those who are exercising the universal right to freedom of assembly, uh, to freedom of uh, expression is the same. People everywhere, people anywhere have every right uh, to uh, use their voice, to assemble peacefully, uh, to make their aspirations known uh, in a way that is peaceful and respects the rule of law. So. Yeah, thank you. On the Israel Lebanon uh, deal, do you feel that this deal mitigates the livelihood of uh, violence erupting between Israel and Hezbollah? From the president uh, about this yesterday, you also heard from uh, the secretary who spoke to this at the top of his uh, bilateral engagement with um, our Norwegian uh, partners. But this deal uh, will create uh, a region that is more stable, a region that's more prosperous, uh, a region that is more uh, integrated. It showcases uh, the ultimately uh, the indispensability of uh, American leadership and uh, American diplomacy. This was the consequence of more than a decade of concerted effort on the part of successive administrations. Uh, and this was something that uh, this administration uh, put a lot of uh, sweat into helping to facilitate, not only to advance uh, opportunity and prosperity for Israel uh, and Lebanon, but also uh, to see to it uh, that once fully implemented, the region is better integrated. That ultimately is in the interests of a more stable 
uh, region, uh, of a region that is potentially less prone to conflict. Now, of course, uh, this deal does establish a permanent maritime uh, boundary, but it doesn't constitute normalization between Israel and Lebanon. Uh, it uh, doesn't settle all of the land disputes between Israel uh, and Lebanon. So we will continue to be a constructive force uh, between and with uh, these two countries and a constructive force in the region more broadly. Let me go south from the Lebanese-Israeli border to the West Bank. Uh, for the third day straight, the Israelis are besieging one of the most, one of the poorest refugee camps anywhere, which is in Shafat, outside this, the old city uh, of Jerusalem. Today, they basically, um, they, they killed a young man, 18 years old, who was extrajudicial execution by uh, all accounts and so on. The situation is really deteriorating. I mean, I know there was a meeting between uh, Barbara Leaf and, and the Egyptian foreign minister, on, but that, that is in Cairo, not in the West Bank. What are you doing, basically, to pressure the Israelis, to lean on them, to hold back? It seems that it's all part of Mr. Lapid's election campaign. Said, it uh, is an unfortunate reality that uh, the recent period uh, has seen a sharp uh, and in many ways alarming uh, increase in Palestinian and Israeli deaths and injuries, including uh, numerous children. Uh, it is vital that uh, the sides take urgent action to prevent even greater loss of life and all of our engagements with our Israeli partners, with our uh, Palestinian partners. We are making the point that uh, now is the time for de-escalation, that further escalation is not in the interests uh, of anyone. It is uh, certainly not in the interests uh, of creating uh, a more stable and calm environment. That's our goal. Do you expect the situation to calm down before the election in I, Israel on, on November 1? I, I wouldn't want to make predictions. What I would want to offer is, is uh, the message we are conveying. Uh, it is a message that is centered on uh, the urgent need for de-escalation uh, so that we can avoid uh, loss of additional life. Andrea. How about on Afghanistan? Um, you spoke earlier about, obviously, the steps you're taking about the women and the Taliban. Um, what obligation does the State Department have to some of the SIVs who have, are still coming back? Um, one family I talked to when we got here in July, a year, just about a year later, and can't get any help. They can't get this is someone who worked for the State Department and, and has not been able to get any assistance to live, to get a job, four children, rent, high rents. What, other than private agencies which don't seem, seem overwhelmed, what obligation does the United States government have? So Andrea, this is something that we have focused on at every step of this. Of course, we do have a special responsibility to those Afghans uh, who have served with and for the United States government over the course of uh, our 20-year military commitment uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, they uh, have been uh, an object of a great effort uh, on the part of the department. That was the case uh, before the evacuation from Kabul International Airport. Uh, last August, it has been the case uh, ever since. Uh, and as we are focused on uh, relocating uh, those U.S. citizens and lawful permanent residents uh, who wish to part Afghanistan, we have not uh, taken our eye off the urgent need to relocate those Afghan allies uh, who also wish to part. And we have done that. Uh, thousands of Afghan allies uh, have been relocated uh, over the course of uh, the months since the end of our U.S. military engagement in Afghanistan. Uh, and there is no end uh, to our commitment uh, to these individuals. Uh, this will continue, uh, and it will continue indefinitely. Uh, once they come to the United States, uh, we have put in place and we have worked uh, with DHS, we've worked with other partners in the interagency, uh, we've worked with our resettlement agency partners uh, to do everything we can, including uh, with some novel programs, uh, enlisting the support of private American citizens, Americans who wish uh, to help host Afghan refugees, who help uh, who, who seek to help them integrate uh, into American society, integrate into uh, neighborhoods, integrate into their new country. 
So this is something that uh, once they are here in the United States, of course, our, our uh, obligation and support uh, does not end. Uh, it's also something we work very closely with DHS uh, and resettlement agency Please, partners. Can, can you take the question and can someone get me some contacts for who in this government might be able to steer them to some agencies or some support? We'll, uh, we'll, we'll see what more we can, we can provide, but we do have a host of uh, partners, refugee um, resettlement partners across the country uh, with whom we work uh, every single day uh, on this, but we'll get you some more specifics. Uh, in the back, yeah. Go ahead, Jenny. Um, uh, Please. Ted, uh, Sam Aknamazi was forced to return to prison today. Do you have any comment? Uh, I, uh, I I don't. This is, uh, I, I was not aware of that. Uh, obviously, that is uh, something that uh, comes as a uh, tremendous setback. Uh, Siam Akhmazi had uh, been held unjustly for uh, far too long. Uh, this is, um, he was released on uh, furlough. Uh, our message had been that uh, his furlough should be uh, extended, and ultimately, uh, like his father, uh, he should have been allowed to leave the country. Uh, Siam Akhtamazi and the other Americans who are unjustly detained in Iran, uh, they are detained on a wrongful basis. Uh, they should be released. Uh, we are working to uh, do everything we can uh, to advance the prospects for their release and for their safe return to their families uh, just as soon as we can. Uh, uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, since Namazi Sr. was allowed to leave Iran, has there been any exchange of messages uh, for the other three um, via the intermediaries? This is, this is something that we're always working on. It is a priority of ours. It has been a priority of ours even before uh, we started uh, indirect negotiations regarding a potential mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA uh, in Vienna early last year. I'm just not in a position to detail the cadence uh, of those efforts, but I can tell you uh, that they remain an absolute priority for ours. Uh, yes, still in a run. Uh, Netblocks, which is an uh, internet observatory, today they reported that there was a major disruption to internet traffic in Iran starting 6 a.m. Tehran times. So this outage is very severe and it's been uh, covered by U.S. media today as well. So I'm going to ask you about the general license um, because we're talking about it in the last three weeks. And this GL, the updates, has been flagged and sold to <clears throat> Iranian people. The Iranian media has a great support. So I think we can verify that today by the very, very big, severe outage we are witnessing. So um, do you have any specific incentives for companies? Um, to communicate with Iran, to provide software, hardware to Iranian people. And I remember that you said before that OFAC is going to communicate with few tech companies to facilitate providing free internet um, to Iranian people. Do you have any updates and do you still believe that GL is really working and supporting Iran? On the general license, uh, this is a general license that is self-executing, meaning that companies who believe their wares, their hardware, their software uh, are permitted to uh, for export to Iran under this general license uh, are able to uh, engage in those transactions. Uh, my point on OFAC and the point we've made on OFAC is that if uh, companies wish to discuss the applicability or potential applicability, uh, of the general license to what it is that they seek to export. Uh, those are conversations that OFAC will engage in. And OFAC, in turn, has prioritized review uh, of those companies who have, that have gone to them uh, seeking uh, guidance on uh, the applicability of the general license uh, to uh, their, their product. Uh, what we can say is that since the time of the introduction of this general license, uh, companies have taken advantage of it, uh, that uh, the general license has facilitated uh, the flow of hardware, the flow of uh, software into Iran. We never intended to characterize the general license as a panacea, as a silver bullet. The fact is that uh, Iranian, uh, the Iranian regime is an authoritarian one. It is one that strictly controls, seeks to control at least, uh, access to and the flow of uh, information uh, between 
Iranian citizens and between Iran and the rest of the world. Uh, there are tools, including some that may be applicable, that may be um, uh, that may be subject to this general license that will help the Iranian people uh, access uh, the outside world, that will help the Iranian people express uh, their voice freely uh, and to communicate not only with one another, but also with the outside world. Uh, and that is something that it was the core uh, animating principle behind the decision to issue this general license as it was uh, behind the decision to issue GLD-1 uh, in 2014. We are going to continue to do what we can to support uh, the ability of the people of Iran uh, to make their voices heard, uh, to make their aspirations uh, heard and known within Iran and within uh, and with the outside world. Um, we'll also, at the same time, continue to impose costs and consequences on those who are responsible for the repression, for the brutal crackdown uh, that uh, many of that, that uh, many of these peaceful demonstrators have been subject to. Uh, and also, uh, you notice that our most recent tranche of designations included those uh, who were responsible for attempts to silence uh, the people of Iran, uh, those responsible for taking steps uh, to limit their ability to communicate uh, freely with one another and with the outside world. And we'll continue to impose costs and consequences and on that as well. And are you still interested in pursuing the nuclear talks? That's not our focus right now. Uh, I think it is uh, very clear. The uh, Iranians have made uh, very clear that um, uh, this is not a deal that they have been prepared to make. A deal certainly does not appear imminent. Uh, Iran's demands are unrealistic. They go well beyond uh, the scope of the JCPOA. Uh, nothing we've heard in recent weeks uh, suggests they have changed uh, their position. And so right now, our focus, just as we were discussing, uh, is on uh, the remarkable bravery and courage that uh, the Iranian people are exhibiting uh, through their peaceful demonstrations, through their exercise of their universal right uh, to freedom of assembly uh, and to freedom of expression. Uh, and our focus right now is on shining a spotlight uh, on what they're doing and supporting them uh, in, uh, uh, in the ways we can. But now, going, just going back to the general license for a second, um, in, in so far, well, and, and the fact that it doesn't appear to have really helped internet access in, in Iran, I, right? I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I mean, so there's blackouts all over the place, as, 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 as she was just saying, and I think it's been well reported that there are. But surely, insofar as it relates to U.S. government policy, supply should meet the demand, shouldn't it? Explain your, explain Well, that. if there's more that you can do to increase the supply <laughs> of Internet access in Iran, surely, after you're using the supply must meet demand argument, I think, Ten, at least eight, maybe ten times at the, at the top when talking about Saudi. There is stuff that you, that you can do, uh, that, the, that the U.S. government can do. To your point, Matt, uh, information and energy are uh, distinct in many ways. Uh, I think one of those is the fact that uh, information and access to information is, is a universal uh, public good. Uh, in some ways, you can never have too much information, and perhaps this is making the point that uh, you were seeking to make. but. Uh, the point I'm making is that we are going to continue to do what we can uh, to support the ability of right, the Iranian the, people. The, the point is that, 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 that you haven't done anything, at, or OFAC hasn't done anything since the general license. Well, the general license was issued just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so uh, I think that is an important detail. Uh, but we are well, always OFAC reviewing. Decision we are just several days ago. We are always redu uh, reviewing what additional steps uh, might be appropriate for us and possible for us to take. Uh, to facilitate uh, the ability of the Iranian people to express what is their universal right. Uh, Shannon. Sorry to backslide a little bit to Russia, but we saw yesterday the president said he suggested that he might be willing to meet with Putin at the G20 if he wanted to discuss the case of Brittany Griner. Today, it seems like the White House clarified and said he wouldn't be open to talking about about Griner to Putin. Just was wondering if you could say specifically if this administration saw room for top level dialogue about uh, the case of wrongfully detained Americans in Russia. 
And also there's a recent report of that Brittany Griner's lawyers say she doesn't appear to be holding up well anymore, her condition's deteriorating. I was wondering if you've had recent consular access to Griner and if the U.S. shares that same assessment on her condition. Our most recent consular access with Brittany Griner was at the beginning of August. We continue to impart uh, on the Russian government the necessity of consistent and regular consular access uh, to uh, Brittany Griner, but also uh, to all of those Americans who are detained in Russia, whether they are detained uh, wrongfully, as is uh, Paul Whelan and Brittany Griner, uh, or uh, if that designation has uh, not been made. When it comes to the president, he also made clear last night that he has no intention to meet with uh, President Putin. Um, the, the fact is that uh, we have uh, made very clear that uh, securing the release of Paul Whelan and of Brittany Griner is a priority for this administration. Uh, we have demonstrated that uh, in a number of ways, including when Secretary Blinken reached out uh, to Foreign Minister Lavrov for the first time since February 24th. Uh, to make clear that uh, the, the U.S. government had put on the table what we've called a substantial proposal and that the Russian government should act on it. Uh, if there is a window of opportunity where senior level engagement uh, could advance the prospects of the release of Paul Whelan and Brittany Griner, uh, we will do exactly what we did last time. Uh, Secretary Blinken or uh, another uh, senior uh, level official won't hesitate uh, to reach out. In engaging with the Russians, however, uh, we will make very clear that uh, there are bilateral issues that may be appropriate for us to discuss. Uh, and of course, Russia's wrongful detention of Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan, that is an issue between the United States government and Russia. But we'll also make equally clear uh, that it is not the role of the, U the United States government to negotiate on behalf of any other country, and that, of course, includes Ukraine. Uh, if there is an opportunity for dialogue and diplomacy uh, to bring an end to this war, that ultimately will have to take place between Ukraine and Russia. We are not going to make decisions for, we are not going to negotiate uh, on behalf of uh, Ukraine or any other country. So we'll follow up on Griner. On, that uh, on, Griner, on, the, sure. on the Griner point, um, I think I heard the president last night. He said he would be willing to meet with President Putin at the G20 if it were about Ryan, if it's not about other issues. I just wonder, maybe I misheard him. And that is exactly what I explained to Shannon. I think the president also added he didn't have any intention at the president at the present uh, to meet with uh, President Putin. But my point was exactly that: if there are bilateral issues, and of know course, ruling that out. But let me also ask you about what. What Ambassador Richardson said on Sunday, because he said he is cautiously optimistic after his trip to Moscow and meeting with officials who we would not name, that they would be released by the end of the year without explaining that. So let me just ask you whether you have any expectation in connection to the October 25th appeals schedule that that court date will be, will change anything, and the concern that apparently her family has, that after that court date, if she's not released, she will be sent to a labor camp and not kept in the facility where she's been kept during the trial. I can't speak to what might happen, what could happen uh, after her appeals hearing. And that is principally because uh, at every step of the way, these proceedings have been uh, largely shams. They've been shambolic. Uh, they have been, um, of course, <laughs> not rooted in the rule of law. Uh, and that is a broad concern we have with uh, Russia, but it is a particular concern uh, we have when American citizens are wrongfully detained uh, and go through uh, this process that is not reflective of uh, the rule of law. All, what I can tell you when it comes to the potential release of Paul Whelan and Brittany Griner is that we are working on it every single day. We have no higher priority. Uh, than the safety of Americans around the world. That certainly includes Americans uh, who are wrongfully detained. We are doing everything we can uh, to see their release as soon as we can. But you can haven't I, had, we haven't had consular access since the beginning of August. Have, has the United States government sought consular access since then and been rejected? We seek regular and consistent consular access to Brittany Griner and to every other American uh, who is in 
Russian custody. That includes Paul Whelan. Uh, that includes other Americans who are detained in Russia. When was the last time you had Paul Whelan consular? access? I'm sorry? Isn't that a very long time not to have consular access? Uh, to we And we seek regular and consistent access, yes. Uh, yes, right there. Question for Whelan. Oh, sure. Go, go ahead. Same question for Whelan. I'm sorry? The same question for Paul Whelan. Uh, we'll see if we can get you the, the latest uh, uh, date of consular access there. We've got another yeah. one on Russia. Um, the, uh, there's some indication, some activity in Belarus uh, that um, has been suggesting that uh, there could be a development where Belarus uh, gets more fully involved in the war effort um, as a result of, you know, alongside Russia, um, partial mobilization. Maybe that uh, Putin is looking to force Belarus to also... Uh, you know, contribute troops to the to the effort. I wonder, you know, is that something you're you're tracking? Uh, do you have any reason to? Have you seen any reason, anything that suggests that that could happen soon? You know, Belarus um, getting fully involved. Um, are you doing anything to deter that? And you know, what would the consequences be for Belarus? We have, uh, along with our allies and partners, uh, have continually uh, worked to see to it that. Uh, Russia, along with the Lukashenko regime in Belarus, uh, pay a severe economic and diplomatic price uh, for Russia's aggression against Ukraine. Uh, with our allies and partners, we have taken action targeting the uh, financial networks and assets of the Kremlin, but also uh, the assets and financial networks that enable uh, the Lukashenko regime and its elites as well. Uh, as long as the regime continues to support the Kremlin and its aggression against Ukraine, uh, we will continue to implement new economic measures against not only Russia, but also Belarus, uh, in particular against their institutions uh, and elites. The fact is that Belarus long ago ceded uh, its sovereignty in significant ways to Russia. Uh, the fact that President Putin has been able to use what should be sovereign uh, Belarusian territory as a staging ground, the fact that brutal attacks against the people of Ukraine have emanated from uh, a sovereign third country, Belarus in this case, uh, it is a testament to the fact that the Lukashenko regime, another testament to the fact that the Lukashenko regime does not have the best interests of its people uh, at heart, and that uh, Lukashenko and his cronies are, uh, as they consistently have, uh, only looking out for their own best interests. A final question, yes. Yeah, on Ukraine, the U.S. General Assembly is about to vote a resolution uh, that condemned the Russian uh, referendum on Ukraine and also the Russian annexation of territories in eastern Ukraine. How do you see the position of the delegations that are going to choose the no, which means to, uh, to not condemn Russia? And also, how uh, do you see the position of, of the delegations that are not going to vote at all, saying that they want to be neutral? And if you, if again, another one in the same matter, has to be three Latin American countries, uh, Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil, they choose to not join a statement regarding Ukraine. Um, your comment on that? Sure. Uh, what is important, I think, is what is at stake uh, in the vote that could happen uh, in the coming hours. It is about uh, more than one country. It's about more than any single block of countries. Uh, it's really about the core principles of the UN Charter. Uh, because what Moscow has done uh, not only uh, is an assault, as I said before, on Ukraine, but it strikes at the heart uh, of the UN Charter. Uh, the notion that a country cannot uh, seize territory by force, uh, the idea that a land grab is not something that the world can countenance uh, in the 21st century, underscoring and preserving those principles are really at the heart uh, of this vote. So in that sense, uh, our ultimate goal is to see to it that uh, this resolution is passed, uh, whether that happens uh, today or, or tomorrow. Uh, we want it to become an official condemnation on the part of the UN General Assembly uh, for what Moscow is seeking to do uh, by uh, attempting to annex uh, these regions of sovereign Ukrainian uh, territory. It is uh, a naked effort on the part of Russia to, again, subvert the UN Charter, the UN system, uh, and the principles uh, behind it. Uh, and you have to remember that there's a vote in the General Assembly for uh, one reason and one reason only, and that is because only one country voted against this resolution when it was in the UN Security Council. Uh, and um, now that it is before, 
uh, the countries of the General Assembly. We believe it's important uh, that the countries of the General Assembly and ultimately the countries of uh, the UN system uh, offer a resounding consensus, and, and we expect they will. Uh, it is also, I think, important to demonstrate uh, the, that the world stands against what Russia is seeking to do. Uh, so in that sense, uh, the yes votes will show that, uh, but so too will the no votes, and specifically so too will uh, what I think we can expect uh, to be a scant number uh, of uh, no votes. Uh, Moscow will almost certainly be isolated. Those countries that vote against this resolution will constitute uh, a rogues gallery uh, of uh, one might imagine the countries that uh, consistently seek to subvert uh, the principles of uh, the UN Charter. Uh, but I should also add that uh, votes in the UN system, uh, they are an important metric, but they're only uh, one metric. And there have been a number of occasions for countries around the world uh, to voice their condemnation for what Russia is seeking to do, to voice their support uh, for what Ukraine is seeking to stand up to. Uh, and over the course of this conflict, uh, it is uh, over the course of this war, we have seen countries that at first exhibited a greater degree of so-called neutrality uh, increasingly condemn uh, Russia's uh, use of force, increasingly call for a diplomatic uh, resolution uh, to this conflict. Uh, that is uh, important as well. Regardless of what happens in the General Assembly, I think the final point is that Moscow is isolated in the UN system. Uh, you saw that in the profound failure on the part of its procedural efforts earlier this week uh, to shield the um, identity uh, of those countries who uh, will vote uh, in this. You see this in the defeat they received in the Human Rights Council uh, a number of days ago. You see it in the fact that Moscow no longer has a seat uh, on the Human Rights Council. Uh, so there have been a number of opportunities for the international community uh, to isolate Russia, to support Ukraine, uh, and we expect this General Assembly vote will be another one of them. Thank you. Thank you.